Everyone, good morning. You have reached the Human K channel. Today, we're going to learn more about information processing theory, which is a very interesting field. American psychologist and cognitive scientist George Armitage Miller made important contributions to the field of psychology. Miller's 1956 paper, The Magical Number 7, Plus or Minus 2, Some Limits on Our Capacity to Process Information, is one of his best-known works. Miller wrote this important paper about the limits of short-term memory. Think of the mind as a complicated system that is more than just a simple series of stimuli and responses. Information processing theory says that information from the world goes through mental processes that shape how we think. Let's look at the model as a whole. We can see that the input or information that comes in goes through cognitive processes and comes out as an output. But this journey has different steps, such as paying attention, recording, recognizing, and storing. The central executive, which controls the amount of information being handled, is at the center of this process. The most basic parts of our brains take in information from the outside world, but the central executive controls how we understand and react to that information. It's important to know that information processing theory looks at how people react to events in real time and how the mind changes that information. As we get older, we get better at paying attention to things, noticing patterns, encoding knowledge, and retrieving it. Over time, we learn how to handle information better. During our lives, we come across a lot of information, connections, and ways to put things into groups. Even though this seems like a passive process, the theory of information processing says that we actively change and rehearse knowledge from our environment in order to remember it. For knowledge about our surroundings to be stored in our long-term memory, we have to pay attention to it, go over it, and figure out what it means. This interaction between nature and culture is a big part of how we grow and change as we get older. But the information processing theory doesn't try to tell the difference between the effects of nature and those of the environment. Now, let's look at what information processing theory is made up of. There are three kinds of memory, sensory, short-term, and long-term. Sensory memory is where we briefly store the information we get from our surroundings. But it is a short-term memory that is inactive and only lasts about 0.5 to 3 seconds. It can only hold about four things. Attention is an important part of moving information from the sensory memory to short-term memory. For knowledge to get into our short-term memories, we have to pay attention to it. If we don't pay attention to it, it goes away and never comes to our attention again. The iconic register for seeing and the echoic register for hearing are the most well-known. But we still don't know much about tactile, olfactory, and gustatory sensors. Think about a cup as an example. When light bounces off the cup and hits our eyes, the image is sent to the sensory register. But if we don't pay attention to it, we forget about it and lose the picture. Often, when we see things we know, we don't really see them because we're focused on something else. Each stage of memory has four important parts. How it is represented, how long it lasts, how it is lost, and why it is lost. In the visual sensory register, for example, a representation is recognizable, stays in our field of view, and lasts for about 250 milliseconds. The main cause of loss is decay. In the same way, the image of the auditory register is echoic and based on sound. It lasts for 2 to 3 seconds. Now, let's talk about short-term memory, which is also called working memory, and is where awareness lives. It is the way that the outside world can connect with what we already know. When we pay attention to something, we actively process information based on what is in our long-term memory. The central executive controls the flow of information in the working memory model. The visual spatial sketchpad saves and processes information about sight and space, while the phonological loop deals with sound information based on speech forms. The episodic buffer brings knowledge from long-term memory to the forefront of our minds so we can use it and build on it. Short-term memory can only hold about 5 to 9 things at a time, and it can only hold them for 15 to 30 seconds. At this time, forgetting is most often caused by interruptions or other things that take your attention away. We often use techniques like practice and chunking to help us remember more in the short term. Rehearsing helps us keep knowledge in short-term memory, which is called 
maintenance. But it is not a good way to get knowledge into long-term memory. If we get stopped while practicing, we might lose the information and have to find it again. For knowledge to move from short-term memory to long-term memory, it needs to be dealt with quickly. For lasting storage, you must link the information to what you already know and encode it. This is helped by encoding techniques like chunking, images, and elaboration. Elaboration, which is the active linking of new information to what you already know, is a great way to remember things. Long-term memory works like a network of thoughts that are linked to each other. By making more connections through explanation, we make it more likely that we will be able to find the information when we need it. Remember that just because you can't remember something doesn't mean you've lost it. It usually means that the process of retrieval is briefly lost. We can find information more easily when we use more detail and take more than one route to it. Now, we'll talk about long-term memory, which is the stage where knowledge is stored and can be recalled after a long time. There are many different kinds of long-term memory. Declarative knowledge is the knowledge you need to finish lines that start with, knowing that. It includes both facts and ideas that we can remember and explain to ourselves. For example, understanding that Paris is the capital of France or that water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. On the other hand, procedural knowledge has to do with knowing how. It uses the skills, techniques, and processes we've learned by doing things over and over again. Procedures are things like knowing how to play an instrument, ride a bike, or type on a computer. Episodic knowledge, which is also called anecdotal memory, is made up of our personal experiences and unique events that have happened in our lives. It's remembering things like your first kiss or how happy you were when you got your diploma. Our own personal stories are made up of these memories. Imagery knowledge is the ability to see things in our minds and remember how they feel. It can be the taste of a good meal, the smell of a flower in bloom, or the sound of waves breaking. Imagery knowledge uses our ability to clearly remember how things feel. We have metacognitive strategic knowledge, which is made up of the ways and tactics we use to improve how we learn and remember things. Some of these ways include using mnemonics, summarizing knowledge, and using organization techniques to help with understanding and remembering. The idea of knowing is another point of view that's worth thinking about. Concepts give us a way to organize and make sense of knowledge. For example, the idea of a bird includes both comments about the bird's qualities and our own memories and pictures of birds we have seen. Now, we're going to look at what it can't tell us about how the brain works and why. Information processing theory makes cognitive thinking easier to understand by looking at it as a linear process. But this model doesn't take into account that different brain tasks can be done at the same time or in parallel. When people are exposed to traumatic stimuli, information can be stored naturally and without any practice. This goes against the linear model, which says that you need to practice something before you can remember it. People also don't like the metaphor of comparing people to robots because they think it makes people seem less human. Also, even though computer models based on this theory are complicated, they can't fully represent the wide range of human thought. We need to think about how people learn to think in concrete terms through words and how they learn to think in abstract terms. Information processing theory doesn't have a way to explain how the hardware of the brain changes during growth. Also, the theory puts too much emphasis on internal cognitive processes and doesn't take into account how much the surroundings and the nature of external stimuli matter. The world around us has an effect on how we think, and we can't ignore the role of our surroundings. Emotions and actions play a big part in how we process information and figure out what it means. But the information processing model doesn't take into account how our feelings or actions affect the way we think. Lastly, the information processing model tends to treat its results as if they are true for everyone, ignoring differences between people and cultures. We have to admit that people's and countries' ways of thinking can be very different from one another. Remember, the human mind is complex, and our understanding of it continues to evolve. As we delve deeper into our studies, let's remain open to new discoveries and theories that shape our understanding of cognition.